Alhamdulillah. We really all praises are due to Allah. We seek His aid and we ask for His assistance. And we ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our souls and the evil of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there's no one who's able to mislead him or her. And whoever Allah leads to go astray, there's no one who's able to guide him or her. Verily I testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah alone and I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last messenger and apostle of Allah. I'm a bad. Okay. As if we didn't need enough reminders how high the states of women are, I'm just going to show you some little points about women in Islam. Because personally, Today, I'm sure the women are better than the men. They come to the mosque more. They read Quran more. They give more sadaqah to the mosque. They're more involved in the activities of the masjid. They're more involved in the activities of the deen. They're more sincere in their actions from what we see. And Allah knows best. So definitely there's no doubt that they're from among the best. And when you look at some of the, the seerah that we're going to speak about today, among them with the first Muslim was a woman. The first person to become a Muslim was a woman. What does that say about the deen? It says that women are, were always there supporting the deen from day one. Drink about it over there. Now, we've got statements of women and wives of the Prophet وسلم, in battle, taking people out. In the battle of Azab, the trench, Azab, the companion Safiya, she displayed brilliant military strategics in handling the attack from the Yahud. Even taking out one of them as well. It's not even obligatory for them to be there, let alone they're there taking people out with strategy and, and battle formations. These are women. As we mentioned before previously, the mother of the believers, Aisha and Um Salim and Um Salit, radiallahu an, they were among those who were profici- proficient in nursing the people on the battlefield, risking their own lives unarmed. And there's other narrations about their, their, their determination and their support and their greatness in times of need. When Islam was in need, the women were there. Who built this masjid? Men. Who paid for it? Women. The reason you got this mosque here is because of your mothers, your aunties, your sisters, the women from the, from the community. Putting money into this mosque to keep it up, to help it up, to cover the bills. Not men. Women. From their political achievements, even Umar, radiallahu an, he so valued the uh, the role of uh, of, of Shifa bin Abdullah, radiallahu anha, for her political intelligence and insight. He used to consult her on running their ummah. Running the whole ummah, he used to consult who? A woman. Because she had very good insight, she was very uh, astute. And he gave her the responsibility of running the affairs of trade and commerce. He gave her her own department. You're, you can run that. She was capable, she was willing, and she was determined. And there's pl- plenty of examples. When it comes to education, Women again, from among the best of the students. The best student furthermore is a woman. Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in trade, and commerce, and in industrials. We just have example after example, such as Khadija, who we're about to speak about now, who was one of the best business people of all of the Quraysh. So just, just a little bit for you to know 
the place that women have. This is what I want to really get home, get the point home. Obviously, we love our mother Khadija radiallahu anha, and we love Aisha radiallahu anha. But I want you to really value the women that we have as Muslims. Don't let the kuffar gas you up and tell you, oh, women are oppressed, women don't have rights, women don't have a say, women are being forced, women don't, they have to, you know, be obedient and subservient and etc. And all of this nonsense they bring. Because if you ever asked a woman, she would never say no, oh yeah, I'm oppressed. I'm wearing this hijab because I'm oppressed. She would never say it. But they never ask her. So in reality, the women have a high status to us. And you honor them. And you have to have this ghira. A ghira for your, for your sisters. Who knows what ghira is? Raise your hand. Okay, we're going to learn something today. Ghira is when you have a love and a passion for your Muslim sister that you'll never let her fall into any harm on the street. For instance, you're a weak, miskeen person and you see a big guy picking on your sister, pulling her hijab or pulling her yogurt. And even a weak man who doesn't pray and smoke cigarettes and drink, he's going to run to her aid. And he's going to take on this big guy. <laughs> Just because it's his sister in Islam, that comes from the ghira, the, the jealousy over, over his sister. We have a difference where when we walk with our women, we have them covered up, no one can see them, uh, exploit them and be, uh, 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 what's the word, like, looking at like, women, no, there's a word for it, it's called um, perverted. When you have the kuffar, they like their women to be naked so that everyone can look. And he wants, he, he wants you to see everything that she's got. He wants her to wear jeggings and tight clothes and breast out. And then when you look, he says, what are you looking at? As if you don't know what I'm looking at. As if you don't know what you, you just your, your wife in. As if you're not happy that I'm looking furthermore. No, us Muslims, we're far different from that. We're not happy about these things. We have this ghira, this, this, this jealousy. This, this, I don't want my wife to be seen. I don't want my sister to be, to be seen. I don't want my, my, the women of Islam to be exploited. And so as men, I tell you now for free, as men, you are responsible for every Muslim woman you see out there. She's your sister. Just like your sister at home, she's your sister. You have to think about it like that. Don't let any harm come to her in front of you. Don't let anybody take advantage of her in front of you. She is your sister. It's upon you to defend her. You're the man. You're the, you're the one that Allah gave as protectors of women. You guys. So you're never allowed to walk past and leave your sister in difficulty, in harm, in struggle. No matter what it is. That's ghira. Walaikum <laughs> And the one who doesn't have any jealousy for his sister or his wife or the women, he will never smell Jannah. It's been narrated. He will never smell the sweetness of Jannah, even though it can be smelled from etc. years distance. A number of years in distance you can smell Jannah from. And you're never gonna get close enough to even smell it. Because you didn't have that 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 sense of protection, that loyalty, that res- that respect, that honour of your women. And obviously, we honor our women far more than these kuffar do. So for them to be gassing and chatting and all this nonsense, it's ridiculous. It's funny, you know. I don't know if I told you guys. My uncle was at a wedding. No, a funeral, excuse me. A funeral of, the, of his sister, kuffar. She died. And so they were getting to him and asking him questions about because they'd seen him on Dean. They, they, some of them hadn't seen him for years. They're like, what, what's this, what's that? And he was there with his wife. And so, some uh, tried to approach his wife, like, oh yeah, I'm so-and-so's cousin, uncle, blah, blah. And he stood in the way, he got in the way, like, no, no, no this is his time, we don't, we don't do that type of proximity, hug and stuff like that. And he's like, why though? I'm her relative. I'm your uncle, I'm your the so-and-so. What are you talking about? 
He said, no, no, no. See, Islam has some ways that we consider sacred, our women are sacred, and only the mahram he's allowed to be in contact with her. He couldn't understand it. The type of could not understand it. And it's funny. If you say to him, would you marry your cousin? He'd be like, oh, no, no. Oh, 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 how can you marry your cousin? Blah, 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 blah. He said, Islam allows it. Islam sees it permissible. But if you ask him, can I hug your wife? He'd be like, yeah, go ahead. Hug her, dance with her. It's all good. He doesn't have that sense of ghira over his wife. Anyone can hug her, hold her, dance with her, and touch her in a way that's not correct. That is the difference between the one who has ghira and the one who doesn't. A Muslim and a non-Muslim. And so who is more status in Islam than the women? After the noble men. So, anyway, moving on. Khadija bin Khawailid, radiallahu anha, is narrated by Abu Huraira that Jibreel came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Oh Rasulullah, this is Khadija. She's coming to you with a dish with uh, food on it. When she comes to you, greet her on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and greet her on behalf of myself and give her the glad tidings that she has been given a place in Jannah where there will be no noise uh, uh, or turmoil or troubles Sahih Bukhari Due to the good character and the nobleness and the honour given to Khadija she earned the greeting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jibreel came and said, Allah said, Salaam Alaikum Khadija. Allah gave the salam to her through Jibreel. No one else can say they had that besides the Prophet She was an example of faithfulness to the Prophet. She was an example of integrity, of truth, of good, modest manners, nobility. She was generous, she was wise, she was understanding. She was brought up in a place where she never knew poverty. Her father was very rich, she came from a wealthy family, she never knew poorness. So she, she's different from the other wives. She was always wealthy. She was the first person to hear hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was the first person to accept Islam. The first person not just the first woman, the first person period to become a Muslim was Khadija anha, and to take on as her way of life as we mentioned she was blessed by the distinction of this hadith that we mentioned Allah came, Allah gave her salams with Jibreel and Jibreel gave her salams and she was the first lady to ever be honoured in such a way she was the first wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never married while he was with her. He can't say this for the other wives. Aisha, he married and married and married. The other wives, so they, they, he married and married. When he was with Khadija, he never married. And he was with her for all, over 24 years. That's a sign there of how much he loved her. How much he fulfilled his desires and his needs and his wants. So she was the first wife and they lived together like I said for at least 24 years. In her house the Prophet used to receive revelations. Ayas used to come down. Meetings with Jibreel used to take place. And during the siege that underwent in Mecca, it's called uh, in Shi'ab Abi Talib, I'm going to get back to that. Remember Shi'ab Abi Talib we we'll talk about it. She was there, supportive, sacrificing the millions that she had. She could be compared to today a millionaire. She gave all of that up for the deen, for the Prophet, for the dawah. Just like women do. Women give, man. Women so provide the carpet you're sitting on board by women. They like that. They think about Jannah, they think about the Akhirah. Where men, men, we get distracted with the dunya. And we're tight with our money. Oh, no, eh, I don't know. But we still want to come here and pray and complain about lights or complain about air conditioning or complain about this or that or no books or this and that. 
If you want that, then put some money in the mosque, isn't it? Even this dawah class that you guys get all the refreshments and cakes and sweets, who do you think provides the money? The sister's side, they do it. The sister's side, they support it. The sister's side go into their pockets, we never say a word to them. And you guys go, oh, I want this crisp, I want that flavour, I want this one, I want that one. You don't think about where it came from. It came from our women. You owe them at least a dua. When Khadija anha, she passed away, the Prophet وسلم, he was heartbroken at a loss. Conf- like, not knowing what to do with himself. She was his most dedicated companion and she was there for him at his most difficult time. The most difficult time the Prophet وسلم, faced was the early stages of the religion, the early stages of Islam, where it was really peak. He didn't have big numbers of support. The Quraysh were giving him a hard time. He even the experience of becoming a prophet. It's not just like you just rip off your chest and you've got this big P here and you're super prophet. No. It takes a gradual progression of difficulty and trials and tests and strengthening. And she was there supporting him through all of that. The only woman by his side. So much so that when she passed away, he dealt with the grave himself. He did the, uh, uh, organized it and had it organized and jumped in it and checked it, dimensions and everything himself and he put his wife in there himself. He didn't let anyone else take care of that. And she was definitely, most definitely, the greatest supporter of Islam in its early days. This religion that you're on today was supported by a woman. The greatest support it had was by the woman in the earliest, in, this, in the earliest parts of it. Not only that, but she's the mother of Fatima, the first lady of paradise, the grandmother of the beloved grandchildren Hassan and Hussein. That was her grandchildren. Fatima was her daughter. She gave the Prophet وسلم, daughters. Abdullah bin Abbas narrated that one day the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he drew four lines in the earth and he, asked, he said to the companions, "Do you know what these four lines are?" They said, "Out of respect, Allah and His Messenger know best. We don't, we don't know what those lines are for." He said, "These lines represent the four most blessed, highest, senior, high-ranking women in the universe to ever have lived." Who were their four lines representing? The first one was Khadija bin Khawailid. The second one was Fatima, daughter of the Prophet. The third one was who? Aisha. Who? It was Maryam bin Imran, the mother of the Prophet Isa. And who knows who the fourth one was? MashaAllah. Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh. The first one is the first mother of the believers, it's obvious almost. The first one who was into Islam. She's among the greatest women ever to have lived to touch this earth. Did he, did, and look, did he say Eve, the wife of Adam? No. no. He said Fat, he said he said Khadija. Think about the status. Then came Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, who's been given the glad tidings of Jannah, and that she will be among the leaders of the women of paradise. And then Maryam, the pure virgin woman who gave birth to a prophet without ever being touched by a man. And then Asiya, the long-suffering righteous wife of the evil Pharaoh. who at a time when all the boys were being killed, every man was being killed, every baby boy was being killed because of the prophecy that Pharaoh, that the Pharaoh had heard that there's going to be a boy from Bani Israel that's going to come and overthrow him. So he started to kill all the boys. Every boy, he used to slaughter them. And the mother of Musa, she put Musa into a basket, threw him down the river. 
the river ended up at the garden of Pharaoh and the, the basket was found by Asiya she convinced the Pharaoh to take uh, for her to adopt the baby and that baby was Musa السلام, who did grow up to overthrow the Pharaoh as the prophecy was true these are the four best women ever to have lived period full stop Aisha narrates that whenever the Prophet وسلم, talked about Khadija, it was in the highest terms of praise. And one day, her, she says her, 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 her jealousy it just overtook her. And she started to speak to the Prophet in a certain way, in an uh, impolite way. Something, I, I can't remember the narration, like, what, why do you always talk about this old woman? That kind of speech. Allah forgive me, I don't have the narration. But I'll paraphrase. Until she said that it, it, it was really over. To, she was getting on to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about this. Thinking, why does he speak about her so highly when he's got me, younger, better wife that Allah has blessed him with? When he, she said that to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a disrespectful tone about Khadija, the Prophet said he got upset. He wasn't happy about it. But as patient, you know, the Prophet said he's a man of patience. And he said, in a calm way, he sighed and he said, I haven't found a wife better than her. I've never been with a better wife than her. So imagine this the man. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying to the wife, Aisha Radha in her face, I never had a better wife than Khadija. So all of this, recognize that first and foremost. She's better, she's the best wife I've ever had. She had faith in me when everyone, even my own family or my own tribe, they all disbelieved in me and turned their back on me. And she accepted that I was a Prophet of Allah and she converted to Islam and she spent all her money, all her millions from the dunya to help me spread the dawah and she did, this, she did this at a time when it was as if the whole world had turned against me and were persecuting me and if that weren't enough it's through her that Allah blessed me with children and as we know, Aisha never gave the Prophet وسلم, any children. So you, can you imagine how that kind of, that remark was like a psh. The way he dropped it, in a polite way, but real, it's the truth. Showing Aisha the status of Khadija. So we have other hadith that say, who do you love most Rasulullah? He said Aisha. But we have hadith where he's telling Aisha the best wife I ever had was Khadija. Who did he really love more? It's not important, but it's interesting. We would say, in the lifetime, it was Khadija. When she passed away, after that, it was Aisha. From the people who are alive. Because remember, the person who's asking this question, he wanted it to be him. He said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent me, he made me the leader of, of an army. So I asked him, who, who, who's, your, who's your favorite, who do you love most? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Aisha, she's the one I love most. And nah, 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 from the men, from the men. <laughs> who, who do you love most from the men? He said, Abu Bakr. Yeah, yeah, Umar. Okay, okay, look. And he said a few more names, it wasn't him. He realized he got the point. He got the point, he wasn't among it. He probably came a bit later on, but he wasn't among the most beloved to the Prophet. And even though the Prophet said it was Aisha, to Aisha, he said that Khadija has been the best to me. She was born in Mecca, she's from the tribe of the Quraysh, and her father was a pious uh, businessman, prosperous, very wealthy. And he, he died in a battle uh, called the Fujar. So uh, Khadija, she grew up with money. She never had pawners. She never knew, you know, being without. She had it all.
she got married at one stage she had two children from that person and she tried to set up a business for that person and uh, that person passed away she got married again because she was still young she had another child but the marriage didn't work out so she decided to devote her time for business now and my children, that's it I raised my children and I set up business and she became very good at business not like the women I want to sit at home and, and watch Home and Away <coughs> she was at home running a business making money, making thousands she was clever, she wasn't a bum you know some wives, mashallah they love the fact that Islam says you don't have to work the husband, it's his job to work but it doesn't mean that she should be a, a, a bum and sit at home all day watching Universal TV no, she should be active obviously she's got her husband to take care of, no doubt obviously she's got the kids to take care of, no doubt and the house to take care of, no doubt and her studies and her dean but she's got plenty of time really she can do something towards supporting the husband in his work or start something for herself and whatever she makes is hers she never has to share it but no, you hear a lot of women yeah I want to get married because then I can just sit at home mm, it doesn't, it's not that straightforward you don't, can't just sit at home and be a bum that's not, what, that's not what Islam is promoting however if you want to and your husband's happy with it Tifadal, Islam made it easy for her but Khadija wasn't like that, she worked, she grinded, she, she, she uh, ran a business and she made a lot of money, she knew what she was doing. And she was good at employing people. So one day she heard about the honesty and the integrity and the principal behaviour of the Prophet And so she sent a job offer to him, to help her trade in caravans. And he gladly accepted the offer, proving it's permissible for a man to work for a woman. Islam is not, has got nothing against a man working for a woman. It's permissible, it's halal. And the best of people did that. So this is obviously before the Prophet became a Nabi. And so he worked for her. And she sent one of her servants, Maisara, uh, uh, one of the men to accompany the Prophet on the business that he used to do. The trip turned out to be very prosperous. A lot of money was made. And the servant was very surprised by the way how the Prophet used to deal with people, how he used to run his business, how he used to be polite, how he used to have good etiquette, how he used to get the best price without bumping people and without deceiving people. They said that he was impressed so much, he completely over, overthrown by how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to uh, carry out his, 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 his principles. And on the way back from Syria, where they used to go and do business, him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he laid under a tree to get a little rest. And then a person, a Jewish monk, a Jewish monk by the name of Nestora, he noted he was, this man, Nestora, he was well known for his knowledge of the deen, of, his, of, of religion and his insight and he asked the servant, who's that guy over there? And the guy, the servant said, that's Muhammad wasallam. and he told him about his reputation, his honesty and his intelligence Nestora said that man's going to be a prophet that man is going to be a prophet in the future because no man ever sat under that tree except prophets and in another narration it said that the servant Masara he saw two angels bearing a cloud over the prophet's head to protect him from the, the heat of the sun and he was stunned either way when Masara got back they got back to the town Khadija was surprised all this peace, all this money, you guys got it in man what the, what, 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 how did, what, what, what happened? and she was deeply impressed when she heard the story of how the Prophet was with, his, with her business so much that she started to think hmm 
I, I, I maybe I'd like to marry I'd like to marry Muhammad sallallahu she wanted to marry him now she started to see so much good characteristics he's so well run in the business he was so good etiquette she started to think I want to marry this guy sallallahu alayhi wa but how could she do it she was thinking well, how is she going to go about it do so many people from the Quraysh noble big people big dons were asking for her hand and she was saying no 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 I don't want to marry you I don't want to marry you Plus, what's her family going to say? He wasn't rich, he wasn't wealthy, he wasn't high status. What's her family going to say? What's her tribe going to say? And why is he going to accept her anyway? He's young, he's not married, he's from the noble tribe, the tribe of Quraysh is noble anyway. Why was he good? She was thinking all of these things. And it shows that there's nothing wrong taking into consideration what your parents are going to say about the person you choose to marry. Take into consideration, if I marry this woman, what's my parents going to be like? Are they going to be alright? If you bring a Chinese lady home, what's probably going to look at you like, <laughs> nice try, nice try. <laughs> She's going to say, how am I going to speak to this girl? How am I going to teach her to cook my and this and that, that she can't speak my life? How are we doing? She might get onto you about it. Consider how she might think. Consider what your people might think. <laughs> Try marry Jareh. <laughs> You'll see what happens. You'll see what happens. What tribe is she from? Jareh. Okay. Bah! <laughs> it, it, anyway. So take into consideration who you marry. Don't, 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 don't just push and force, I want this person, blah, 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 blah. Because if your parents are not happy with the person you choose, and they're not happy with you after your marriage, then that can take from the back of the marriage, and the marriage can end in a sad way. Please your parents when you make your decisions for marriage, inshallah. Anyway, she, quit, she pondered over this decision, what to do, how to go about it. And she had a dream about the sun coming down and landing in her back garden and lighting up the house. So when she woke up, she went to her cousin, Waraka, a man who was very well known for his dream interpretation and the depth of his knowledge in regards to the Torah, the book of Musa, the Injil, the book of Isa alayhi salam. When he heard the dream, he gave a little smile. <laughs> he said, don't worry, this is a very good dream. The sun in your, coming into your garden represents that the Prophet وسلم, is coming soon. And that the event that he lands in your garden means it's gonna enter, that he's going to enter your life. He's going to be involved in your life and light in your life. So after this, meeting with uh, Waraka, Khadija got more excited about marrying the Prophet. She's like, yeah, this is really good. I'm, I think this is the one. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about it. One of her close friends said, look, it's not healthy, you wanted this guy and you know, you're not doing nothing about it. There's nothing for me to go and ask him. She said, okay, go and ask him then. And she did. But look, she did it with hikmah. She went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is the, serf, the, the friend, and she said to him, um, so how come you're not married? He said, I don't have the financial ability at the moment. My financial resources aren't quite ready for me to do that right now. She said, okay. Hmm. Would you marry a woman who had money and she was rich and she came from a noble family? But she had a, she had a liking to you, she wanted to marry you. Would you marry that person? The process of that, right, who, 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 what, come on. Who? Who? Then she said to her, Khadija. Upon hearing that, the Prophet said, yeah, I'd accept, I'd accept that, that, that proposal. So she went back to Khadija, Khadija got very excited. Point here. If you send your friend to go and speak to a sister or someone sends you... Well, I thought I owed you money or something, right? I'm jumping on If you go and ask somebody for marriage on behalf of a friend, 
use Hikma, man. I thought it was Samaria. What are you saying, girl? <laughs> you on this thing or not? <laughs> nah, man. Use Hikma. The first question is, uh, are, you, are you even married? And give her a way out. Give her a way out. Don't corner her like that. Yeah. Yes or no? Huh? <laughs> give, her, give her a way out. See? Are you ready for marriage? Are you interested in marriage? There's a brother who's interested in you, for instance. That way, she has an opportunity to say, I'm not ready for marriage right now. Which means, no, I don't want him. Or, I'm considering someone else. You mean, get out of here, i got a better guy. <laughs> the point being is that, don't just corner her, don't just throw it on her. Use Hikmah, look how she came to the Prophet. Why aren't you married, like? We, look, we, know from the, we know what she's getting at. The person said he did it. She came using Hikmah. He said about his financial reasons. He said that there's a woman who's got finance, she's got money, she's interested in you. Use the Hikmah when you're going to approach sister. And don't go with your mobile phone now, it might look a bit funny. We might pull you up because we've got Gerira for our sisters, you understand? I see brothers chatting up sisters on road. It's not going to look good. I'm not going to buy it that you're trying to ask her for your friend. I'm going to pull you up. Inshallah. But anyway, the principle is, go about it in a good way with Hikmah. Use your brain. Either way, the Prophet ﷺ, he accepted, she became excited. The Prophet ﷺ, he was 25 years old. And Khadija was 40 years old. And this is a dalil that there's nothing wrong with marrying older or younger. The Prophet said married Aisha, she was younger, he married Khadija, she was older. There's no rules to the age, as long as that she is upon deen, she is mature, she is prepared for marriage, her family are happy. You find in her characteristics of deen. Don't get excited, you lot. You lot are like, what, 5th 12th? Get out of here, you ain't ready for nothing, yeah? The point is, age isn't an issue. Age isn't an issue, don't get excited, you lot. <laughs> so Khadija was 40 years old at that time. <laughs> so the Prophet got his uncle Hamza and Abu Talib to arrange it with her uncle Omar bin Asad and then the date was fixed. The wedding got prepared and it took place. And there's a woman, Halima, Halima Saadi, who used to nurse the Prophet ﷺ. She was like his foster mum. She was like his foster mother, taking care of him in, at his youth. She was invited, special inv invitation for her for the wedding. She travelled all the way from uh, where her village was to Mecca. After the, the wedding had taken place, <coughs> Khadija decided to give her a whole house worth of goods. A whole house furnishing. She gave her a camel, which was like a car. Is that giving someone a bimmer? She gave her 40 goats. That's like a few years worth of food. Just as gratitude could she raise this beautiful man to be her husband. Just as gratitude that she'd raised the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that she was so happy with the husband that she had. So when you go and you find a wife and you're happy with her, you've seen everything you like, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah Allah, you knew exactly what I wanted, you gave me just what I wanted. Now you go to her mother and you give her mother a gift. Something very nice, something very special. Because she raised her. It's just like you raising your daughter for 16 years, 18 years, 20 years, feeding, teaching, clothing, educating, protecting. And then you give her away now, it's time for her to get married. And you've groomed her to be the best of daughters, the best of wives. That man should respect you and appreciate you for that. Because there's bare bonehead sisters out there. Bare knuckleheads, taking off hijabs, taking off abaya. Abaya in front of the mosque, trousers and jeggings outside in the evening. Not being brought up with good tarbiyah. 
They don't know how to clean. They don't clean themselves. They don't know how to, 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 to take care of a man. They don't know the eyes of Allah. It's a problem. So the one who does that and brings you a good sister who has all of those things, you owe that parent gratitude, man. You owe that parent something. So take from the example of Khadija and bring a good gift to the person who is the mother or the father of the person that you end up marrying, inshallah ta'ala. Another blessing of Khadija's marriage to the Prophet that she had six children. Two sons, Qasim and La Abdullah, mashallah. And he had four daughters. Put your hand up. If a man could give me the names of the four daughters, I'll give him a free atal later on, inshallah. The four daughters of the Prophet him. Who wants to try? <laughs> What's, what are you, what are you? <laughs> Can you use this finger, please? Thank you. Akhi. Huh? No, no, I want four. Four. Who can give me four? From Khadija. The four from Khadija. The four daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They have atar in it for you. What atar? Yes. Choose. Go for it first. On on the two. I need four, I need four. Who can give me four? It's not enough, we need four. Who can give me four? Fatima, Zainab, Hafsa, Rukia. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. What is it? Alright, alright, alright. That's four, that's four, correct, mashallah ta'ala. No, because he gave you the last answer. You can, you can share it. Inshallah. <laughs> there's an atav, there's an atav there for you, you guys, you can both have it, mashallah. Zaydeb, Ruqayya, Umm Kaltum, and Fatima, radiallahu anha. They were the daughters of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were wonderful, intelligent children, brought up in a household of peace. But the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he still didn't have happiness, complete happiness. There was something bothering him. His heart was agitated and he used to go off a lot. Once a month he would go, once a year, for a month he would go to the cave of Hira and just spend time in there meditating and praying. And now you can still go to that cave, you can see it. You can go to the cave of Hira where the Prophet Sassim used to go there. Where? Where? You're going to hear what took place in there. It's very small, it's not very big. Like, under this table, a bit more long. It's tight. Anyway. Huh? It's been described to me, I haven't been there personally. Now, so he felt something grab him while he's in the cave. In the cave. Squeeze him. Squeeze on his chest. Pressing on his body like he was going to pass out. Picture it. It's saying Steven Stilberg. Something grabbed him. He couldn't see what was going on. Well, who it is, what it is. And then when he let him go, he said, read. Ikara, read, recite. He said, I'm illiterate. I can't read. I don't know how to read. He grabbed him up again. Squeezed on his chest. Almost breath gone. Let him go again. Ikara, read. Again, I'm, I'm illiterate. I don't know how to read. Again, grabbed him up, and again, and again, until he recited the ayat. Who knows what ayat was recited? Ikra. Mashallah. Ikra. The first ayat to be recited. Read in the name of your Lord who created you from nothing. He created you from a clot of blood. Read from your Lord who is the most generous, who taught the writing by the pen and taught men which he, man what he didn't know before. And then that being disappeared. This was such an awesome experience as you can imagine, really and truly. If you're sitting in your room and something grabs you up, you're going to be baffed. Don't act. You're going to be baffed. They're going to be like, oh yeah, yeah, that was, you're going to be baffled, what's going on, what the, the Prophet Hussain was confused, he was shivering, trembling, shaking, what was that? 
He ran back home, still shivering and shaking. He called out for Khadija, bring me something to cover me, I'm cold, shaking. She came, she covered him, she supported him, she held him. After a period of time, he calmed down a little bit more, he was able to speak a bit clearer. He calmed down to some extent where uh, he, you know, he was able to sit up. And he told his wife, Khadija, that he was in fear of his life, he thought he was going to die. He thought this person was going to kill him. And he told her the whole thing. And she was the one, the first person to hear about the ayah, the revelation, this hadith. And she was there supporting him, saying, Wallahi, you're a good person, man. No one's going to harm you. You never lied, you never stole, you never cheated. you never done anything bad for someone to do something evil towards you. Wallahi, Allah will protect you. And she encouraged him and gave him words of soothing support. And I swear to you, there's nothing like the support of your wife. The other day, okay, the other day, I had a go with my wife. I got into her. The other wife heard and she was there and she was like, she went off crying, whatever. Then she went with her, listen, you know what he's like, don't cry, da 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 da. She came to me, why are you treating your wife like that, man? Come on, man, da, 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 da. be nice to her. Alright, alright, cool, cool, cool. I'll go to her later. You know what? No, that's a bit wrong, blah, blah, blah. Sorted. it. The next day, I'm having a funky week. I have bone out on this wife. Brrrah! <laughs> she gets upset. She starts crying. The other one now, she calls her up. Ah, oh, listen. You know it's me the other look, I'm here, you know, you know what he's like, man. Like, don't watch that man, it's nothing man. I, I got you, right, 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 She comes to me, how are you gonna get onto your wife like that? She's your wife, blah, blah, blah. don't deal with her like that, blah, 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 blah. Alright, 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 cool, 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 alright. I go into her, alright, yeah, you know what it is, man. I was just having a funky read like that. We squash it. The next day, I'm under the pressure of my life. This is that that's going on. I go home and I'm sweating and I got a headache, man. Don't talk to me right now, man. And they're both giving me, oh, may Allah bless you, you're our husband, we love you, man, don't worry, you got this, we got you, blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah? Uh, you know what? <laughs> yeah, so give me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, you're right, you're right. It's going to be okay. There's nothing like the support of your wife. Nothing like it. You're going to tell her things and talk to her about things. You can't tell your best friend. She knows things about you that you can't tell your best friend. But you can talk to your wife about it, and she'll be supportive, and she'll understand, and she'll console you, and bring your heart down to level, and help you, and make you feel at ease. So what about this, where the Prophet was grabbed by Jibreel, and squeezed? She consoled him, look, I think you, you, you might be a prophet, you might be the prophet of Allah. Don't worry man, you're, you're in the bead man, this ain't, this, ain't, this ain't what you think, you're not going crazy. I got you. It's all right. And she calmed him down. And she made him feel comfort. At a time when he really needed it. You've never seen the Prophet Sassam this week before. This is when he really needed the support. She was there for him. She was the first person to accept that he was a prophet. And accept that he was... And to be a Muslim. At this point. And so that soothing that she gave him. Gave him strength that he couldn't... He can't measure. And gave him confidence. And then she took him to her, her cousin again, the one that interpreted the dream, Baraka. The blind one. Straight away he said, yeah, you was in a cave, isn't it? That must have been Jibreel. And yet, you're the messenger of Allah. Because Jibreel, he came to Musa as well. Yeah, he just came to you. This is what it is. And I wish I, I, wish I was younger, I wish I'd be there when you become a prophet. And they kick you out. The Prophet said, they're going to kick me out? I'm from Croatia, from the biggest tribe, we're, we're, the, we're the dons, what, what, who's going to turn on me? He said, yeah, there's never been a prophet that came from amongst the people and said that they, didn't, they rejected him and they tried to kick him out. And he said, I wish I would be there when it happened so that I could support you, be on your side, back you. And that, 
testament, that's testimony that they both accepted Islam from the Prophet So she was supportive, no doubt about that. She gave him, as we mentioned, six children, four daughters, two sons. We know who the daughters are, alhamdulillah. One daughter Zainab, she married a man by, by the name Abdul, Abdul As bin Rabih. Rukaya, she, ma- she married Uthman. When she passed away, she married the other daughter, he married the other daughter of the Prophet, Umm Kaltum. That's why he's known as, was he known as Uthman? What's his, what's his kunya? Yeah, Uthman ibn Affan, but what's his kunya? No rain. It's no rain. The two lights. Because he got one daughter of the Prophet, she died, and he got another daughter, two wives from the Prophet. So he got the nickname, the two lights, Noreen. And Fatima, she married Ali bin Abu Talib. As we mentioned, the Prophet had three sons, two from Khadija. Who was the other son? What's the name of the other son? La. Who is the other son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? There we got it now, MashaAllah. Ibrahim, the son of Maria. The first son, Qasim, was from Fatima. The second son, Abdullah, from Fa- uh, sorry, not from Fatima, from Khadija. They both died when they were young. And when they died, the Kufar started getting excited. Look, ha, your youths are dying. You're never going to have any kids. Your prophecy is going to finish where you are. It's going to die where you stand. There's no more generations for you. And then when they saw Ibrahim was dying, and the Prophet saw that Ibrahim in his young age, he was dying, he was about to die. He picked him up and he said, we're helpless. There's nothing that we can do in front of the will of Allah. What Allah wills is what Allah decrees. He wasn't like, oh, no, 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 he said, this is the color of Allah. Furthermore, if you think about it, if a baby passes away or a woman has a miscarriage and a baby dies in a cot or whatnot, whatnot, isn't that child going to be in Jannah with Ibrahim? He doesn't get judged. Some say he's not going to be judged. He's going to go to Jannah and be with Ibrahim. Straight ticket, free Jannah. Some say on Yom Al-Qiyamah, He's going to get a test. Quick test. Islam or Kufr. But Islam looks like the Kufr and the Kufr looks like Islam. A river, two rivers, fire and water. Jump in one. And he's going to be tested like that. That's what some say. Some say, if you don't reach the age of manhood, that's it. Free ticket to Jannah. You're fortunate. So why cry and get so upset? Naturally, don't get me wrong. It's going to be upsetting, but the Qadr is there for you. It was the color that took that. And if that child didn't reach an age of, of maturity, when you get to Yom Al-Qiyamah, he can say, nah, 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 that's my brother, he's coming to Jannah. Bring him to Jannah, Allah forgive him. But you can bring a number of people with you. If that child is in a position to ask for the Rahmah, say, nah, my mom's coming with me. My dad's coming with me. My brother's coming with me. My sister, my sister's husband. So, no reason to be so distraught about such a thing. It's from the Qadr, even though it's not easy to deal with. So when Ibrahim died, the people started getting gassed up. The Kufar. And they were... Uh, say, first, the people started to say, when Ibrahim died, the eclipse came. The sun got blocked out. It's by the moon, it became dark. And people were like, that must be because of the death of Ibrahim. And then the Prophet said, no, 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 no. People, the eclipse doesn't mean someone died or someone was born. It's just from the, the, the qadr of Allah. And when it comes, you do the salah. It doesn't mean anything particular about people. My son died, that's it, he died. It's nothing to do with the sun and the moon. So anyway, as, as I was saying, the Kufar, they started to call him Abtar. Abtar. It means the one whose kids have been cut off. He's got no more lineage. That's it. Your family stops right the way you are. You don't have no more one to carry on your name. 
that Allah had better bounties in store for the Prophet and he revealed the ayah al kufr Inna atoinaka al kufr fisalli li rabbika wana inna atoinaka al kufr Inna atoinaka al kufr fisalli li rabbika wana <laughs> Basically, really, you've been granted al kofa a, a, it's a, a, a fountain on, on, in Jannah, on Yom al Qiyamah as well. And that the, and, Therefore, turn to your Lord with sacrifice. And the one who hates you, really, he's the one that's been cut off. So Allah refused those people who say that. When the people start to realize that they can't get the Prophet Wasallam, they're trying to bribe him with women, bribe him with money, they're trying to kill him, they can't get him. They're like, right, this is it, what we're going to do? We're going to boycott the Prophet Wasallam, And no one's allowed to buy from him, sell to him, talk to him, give to him, take from him, live by him. Nothing. You're not allowed to do anything with the Prophet Wasallam and those Muslims. And, and there was a boycott of Bani Hashim. And it was a hard time. Adults are surviving off leaves of trees. I don't think anyone's ever ate a leaf of a tree to sustain yourself. Maybe you have, but Allah has it. No one is that situation where you have to eat the leaves from the trees. For three years, the Prophet Sallallahu had no food, no money, no nothing, and he couldn't he couldn't do business with anyone. And who was there supporting him? Khadija, with her millions, she spent it on the people, providing until it ran out. And for three years, they suffered without any goods or any provision and that is a well known story in Islam and it's called the history and the story of Shi'ab Abi Talib as I mentioned Shi'ab Abi Talib is the place where they went outside Mecca and they had to stay there for three years in poverty in famine without food, without contact it was a tough time but Khadija was there even though she, and imagine this She's been brought up in luxury. She's always had, she's never been without. And now her husband, because of his cause, she's in a situation of poverty. Was she in the situation of? You heard them, you say it, repeat it. Oh yeah, good, okay. But she still didn't give up the side of the Prophet She still didn't give up the deen of Islam. Khadija passed away three years after the Hijrah. Three years after the Hijrah is when Khadija, anha, she died. She died at the age of 65, having been with the Prophet ﷺ for over 25 years and supporting the cause of Islam for just as long. When the Prophet ﷺ saw her on the brink of death, death was close to her. She was getting a bit scared, a bit worried. He consoled her, he came to her saying, Allah has written this for you, ordained it for you. And the thing that you're worried about is going to turn out to be in your favor. MashaAllah, Aki, are you recording this? You're typing it down. You're going to ping it to me later. I'll put it on Facebook, MashaAllah. When the Prophet saw that his wife was dying, she was dying, she's on her deathbed now. She's about to pass away. The one who supported him from day dot, from scratch, she was getting worried. He said, don't worry, don't worry. The only thing between you and all of the, the khair that Allah's got written for you is this stage to get through. When he said that to her, 
she looked up at him and her eyes lit up she became happy and she gazed at her husband with the look of love and happiness and comfort and just as she was doing that the soul left her body and she passed away and the Prophet وسلم, he dealt with the grave operation herself the dimensions, everything. He took care of it. He jumped in there, checked it out, made sure the dimensions, made sure the hole was perfect for her. Then he got out and he put the body in himself. I'll deal with this. His beloved wife, his number one companion. The first Muslim. The first Muslim. The first wife. The first one to give the Prophet children. The best of women to be created. The most beloved. Questionably. I said that was the passing away of the mother of every single Muslim. The one who sacrificed all her millions, everything for the deen, for the dawah, for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that was the hardest year for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His wife died and his uncle Abu Talib died as well a few months later. There were two great losses because these were his two number one supporters. It was an emotional period. And he was in a lot of grief and a lot of stress about how he's going to portray and uh, continue with the theme, the dawah, perpetrate, propagating the dawah. Because Abu Talib, he had opened a lot of doors for him. And Aisha she, and, and Khadija supported him in a lot. What's wrong with you, though? Have you got something more important to say? What are you talking about? Tell me. Come on, tell me. What do you say? One of the ladies of the Quraysh, she visited, she went to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when, you know, he looked really down. She could see it on him. And she said, like, man, you look... You don't look good, man. He replied, I'm paraphrasing by the way. <laughs> Obviously. He replied, It's only natural that the one who got touched by such an absence, after having that loving mother of the children, now the children don't have that loving mother. She was loyal, she's sympathetic, she shared my close secrets. The only human. It's only human that it's natural that I should feel this loss for her. Even Khadija, Aisha, she said, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he used to get gift, now when one of the companions said the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he was given a gift, he was sharing with Khadija's friend, one of Khadija's friends. Every time he gets something, he share it with one of Khadija's friends. To Aisha radiallahu anha said, "Why do you do this? The Prophet says, "I have a great regard for her friends as, as she has a special place in my heart. I love her so much, even her friends I'm going to take care of them now. That's how close she was. That's how much he loved her Lisa. Aisha, imagine this now. Aisha radiallahu anha said, I never experienced more jealousy for anyone, for any of the wives of the Prophet, as I did for Khadija. Why? Because there's a rivalry in that love. Even she's dead. She's jealous of a dead person. Subhanallah. That's how much the Prophet used to love and talk about our mother Khadija. Now, and the last one I says in Surah Al-Fajr, oh one of complete of completeness, rest and satisfaction, the one who's died. Come back to your Lord well pleased with yourself and well pleased with Allah. And enter you among those servants who enter Jannah. In reference to our mother Khadija. Point. 
it's interesting who she loved more. Yeah, it's a good thing to think about. But what's more important is the example of the best woman. The example that the women hold in esteem. The example that they, they, they reflect from the beginning till now. Even now, sisters are better than us. We, can, we can't seem to get ourselves up. What are you, doing? What are you shaking your head for? You, you disagree? No, 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 come on, talk. <laughs> Don't gas yourself. The sisters are better than us, bro. The sisters are better than us. And we should be competing with them, but they're hard to keep up with, mashallah, because they get it in for the deen. So don't let anybody speak down about your sisters Or down about the mothers of, of, the, of, of the believers Or down about any woman in Islam forevermore It's your duty to protect her And when you're looking for a good wife and an example This is the, what you should be looking for Not Rihanna and Shakira and whoever else These are the examples of good women, good wives Of piety And Allah knows best فَنَكَالَهُمَا بَعْضُهُمْ كَشَرُّ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ نَسْتَفْكَرُ تُبَالِي